Hello viewers, well now I'm joined by Stephen and Rod from the development team of Project Cars 2. We've been looking forward to it for a long time, chaps. It's been an enormous development. I guess, Stephen, as you've got the mic, kick off with really Project Cars 2, what's been the biggest challenges of getting this off the ground and bringing it to this point? Because, I mean, when we talk about some of the options in it, it's really such an enormous game. Where do you start when you're preparing something like this? Yeah, it's always an interesting challenge, right? Because you've got to start off by going with what the fan base out there wants. Mm -hmm. And there was, with, during the development of Project Cars 1, of course, there was a lot of stuff that people asked for. The guys in the WD community got to play the game early on. A lot of things that they asked for that we tried to get into the game. Some of those things were simply not possible to include. Purely, some of them just fell out of scope, that we just didn't have enough time to do it. Other ones, we just didn't feel like our technology was quite there yet to do it, and it wasn't good enough yet. So when we start off with Project Cars 2, the first thing we do is we revisit the cutting floor, as Rod calls it. So we go and say, well, these are all the things that we have to chop. So let's see what of this, what of these things are feasible for us to include in our Project Cars 2. So some of those things are, or many of those things are uh, things that we would have liked to have ourselves, but again, it fell out of scope. So going into Project Cars 2, there were the obvious things like fully animated pit crews, you yeah. know, having proper triple screen support out of the box. Those things that the, the hardcore fans really, really wanted and we just couldn't deliver. But then there are other things that are far more important, broadly speaking, and that is like improving our tire model. There, it's an evolutionary thing, right? You keep on pushing, pushing. It's such a complex thing to simulate, just a single tire model. And every generation, we are just gonna get closer and closer to how it is in real life. So big challenge for us is to decide on how far we're gonna push that. What is the most, important low-hanging fruit that we can gain from improving our tire model. The same for our, view, for our weather system, adding new weather conditions, adding the seasonal simulation, and then looking at it and saying, well, these are all the things that we're gonna do. How the heck are we gonna put this in in a two-year development cycle? Um, and then again, you end up with things just having to be chopped and saying, well, it's not gonna make it. We're not gonna have scope for this. If we do, we're not gonna do this to the full extent that we wanted to do. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much where it starts off. I know, well, exactly. I mean, well, we're at Brands Hatch, why not? No, I, I, so, I mean, I just look at it and I think as an independently developed product, you've come from a starting box, if you like, and you've included more options than anyone else, more tracks. I mean, I speak to developers and they say, oh, I can't be done, we're restricted to this many cars, this many tracks, and you guys have broken the rule book in a way. We're slightly you, mad, right? Yeah, we're slightly mad, exactly. <laughs> slightly mad, slightly crazy, and you've broken the rule book and you've got all these cars of different ages, uh, you've brought all these different circuits and this sort of track technology in there, in the live track 3.0. I mean, when you sit down and you say, right, we're gonna produce a living racetrack, you know, I mean, that's the scale of that project in itself is, is enormous. You know, where do you even come up with these, you know, in terms of looking at a resource? I've just been amazed so far with what we've got in the game before we even get into it. Well, just quickly speaking to the weather thing, it is the way that we approach it makes it both hard and easy because what a lot of the other guys out there, well, basically what all of them out there really do, the other guys, is they provide the weather conditions for some location. So on some tracks you have rain and sunshine, others you have this condition that you have what. So our approach was, let's do a proper accurate um, uh, simulation of weather systems and have that accurate based on where on the planet you are. So once we then develop this accurate simulation of weather conditions, we just plot the track in there. We just pop the track into the, into the location where it is on the planet and it works, it's accurate. So we have this whole anytime, anywhere thing, right, that we brag about and we're very proud of. And part of that is that we simulate everything dynamically on all of the tracks. So anywhere you go, you can have all of these various weather conditions, seasons, and, and how that affects the handling of the car and what it does to the track surface itself and our live track technology. It is, um, it's a different approach, it's a different way of of getting to the same end goal, but the big advantage of it is initially it's a lot more work and it's a lot more to simulate because now you're not just simulating what it, the car handles like, you're simulating and you're doing an accurate simulation of a planet basically. Yeah. Um, and, well. and the sun and the moon and all of that of course because it all plays a role, right? Yeah. It's not just for looks, it all plays a role. But the benefit of that is that we get that automatically everywhere on all our tracks. Well, well I will just say I, I raced Monza in the winter at 2 p.m 
and the sun, the, the lighting changed, and I thought, my goodness, look at the shadows, amazing. Rod, question for you really now. We've got a lot of different sort of racing classes in this game. You know, we've got, I mean, when people often look to me and they say to me, Alan, how does this car drive and how does this car drive? And I say, hey, Slightly Mad Studios had seven racing drivers to tell them what I'm trying to do in one person. In terms of the challenges and the new classes, what have you most enjoyed bringing to Project Cars 2? Well, we try and look at both what's popular now yeah. um, and what's popular with our fan base. Uh, a good example there is GT3 racing. Is um, it's a it's a very popular style of racing right now, and there's race series all over the world, and there's a lot of very exciting cars that um, are being used. So we knew that we wanted to focus on that type of thing, and we have. Um, a few different racing drivers on our team who race GT3 and GTE cars, so they're very well informed of how the car should handle. Um, we also have access to a lot of other drivers who come and test once in a while. They're not part of our main um, group of seven drivers who are on the track development or sorry, the game development roster. But the, we have a lot of other contacts with racing teams, racing drivers, and they come through the office in London and we also have tests that we do in Los Angeles as well with a partner company CXC Simulations. So the modern cars are something that we're quite passionate about but we also want to give our fans the ability to experience different golden eras of racing and there's a bunch of us on the team who love racing history whether it's going back to the early 2000s, the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s um, and we want to bring these racing eras to life so it could be something like a modern racing festival, like um, you would say at Silverstone Classic or Monterey Historics, where people bring out their classic race cars and they race them. Or uh, we also want to be able to time travel and put the old race cars back on these tracks which don't exist anymore. Yeah. And we want to give people these experiences. One thing that's also new with Project Cars 2 is that we've changed the philosophy a bit with the car list. In the past, we would pick some pretty iconic race cars, but they often would have no one to race against. We, we called them orphans. We said, we don't want orphans this time. Whenever we select a iconic race car, we want to give it friends to race with. So we often are trying to get four to six cars that belong together on the racetrack in a historically accurate way so that you can recreate different eras or even create a fantasy scenario, have the modern race cars on the old racetracks which are incredibly dangerous on high speed, no runoff area, you go put two tires off, you're gonna virtually die, so yeah. to speak. Um, so we wanna give this wide variety of uh, different experiences. Well, it's interesting you say that, because there's a lot of racing games that either have, that have a handful of classic cars, where there's no one to race against from the same era, yeah. or they've got some classic cars and no tracks from that classic era yeah. that represent the style of racing for that time. Yeah. You know, I was racing in around Monza Classic, you know, I love Monza Classic, you know, and Hockenheim. I think it's another track, really, that's lost its soul since they've changed from the old Hockenheim. It's just not the same. It's not the same, it's not the same no. And so I think with the... I, I'm, I'm a fan of classic Formula One, as everyone will know, and classic, you know, right down through the ages. But also, in terms of VR, I, I, I think Project Cars really... It didn't run as well the first game. I'm sure the second game will run perfectly on VR, but the first game, what amazed me was the way I was leaning over and looking at where to place my wheel and the lines yeah. and everything. A quick question the, about... The depth perception is also amazing when yeah. you're on the street circuit, say yeah. Long Beach, yeah. and you can sense the distance to the wall yeah. and put put your car this far from the wall yeah. with the depth perception you get with VR. That's incredible. I noticed incredible. that, actually. Um, you know, you're, when you're racing around Spa, you got Turn 1, which is a hairpin at the top of the hill. The source. And when you're... Uh, you're going around and literally I could just line the car up really close to the wall. I couldn't do that with the yeah. screen in quite the yeah. same way. There's just something about that yeah. sweeping motion that you can just go for that moment and you do it in VR. Just a question on VR performance in, uh, in Project Cars 2. Have you guys been able to optimize that? Project Cars 1 struggled even with powerful graphics cards. I know some of our viewers, a minority, will have VR headsets, but we're out there. Uh, yeah. Have you managed to make any inroads there in performance? It's something that we keep on pushing on, obviously, all the time. We're still working on it, in fact, right now. And yes, we've improved performance, we've improved features, we've given you more scalability. So we have the 
famous super sampling thing is an option there. So yeah. if your hardware can handle it, you can push the fidelity, the visual fidelity, quite a bit higher. Um, we also added a number of little features that, well, I say little, they make a big difference when you're in the car, but on the surface they may sound like a little thing. For example, when you, when you drive a car for the first time in real life, you get in the car, typically the two first things you do, right, is adjust your seat position mm -hmm. and then you adjust the mirrors. So those are little basic things that you take for granted, but now being able to do that in the simulation, you get in the car, and especially in the open wheelers where there's not much room for all sorts of like seat adjustments and tweaking and things like that. It's such a cool thing to be able to change your mirrors so that you yeah. can, like you would in a real car, just set them up so that they're optimal. And then little details like the mirrors actually acting like proper mirrors when you lean around. So you can hear there's a car behind you because we've got full positional audio now, which makes a massive difference in VR. It's a huge thing in VR because you have this, it, it sounds like you're there, right? And you can hear there's a car behind you, but you look in the mirror and you can't see and you lean over and you're like, oh, there, there he is. So we added all these features, which of course means additional performance challenges. So it's been, a, it's been talking of challenges, it's been a challenge for us to get the game to perform well enough in VR so that it is um, optimal. So you, you don't have a, a bad experience. Because as soon as you have frame rate drops, people struggle with nausea and, or, and, and the like. Um, it, it's really a combination of two things, right? It's like finding the best performance we can and we continue to work on that. And secondly, giving options into the player's hand so they can scale things up and down to suit their system. Now, a couple of things, I suppose, fans watching this, they're, they're going to be, the question's asking is, is controller input, you know, and I'll be going over controller input in various, uh, uh, you've made radical improvements and focus on controller this time. Um, but also, I guess, you know, I mentioned Rallycross again, because Rallycross is a big deviation from the first game, isn't it? You're going off-road, it's a new entry, you're entering into a new attack now, you know, fighting on several yeah. fronts. Um, what are the challenges about moving into a, a a rally cross game as well especially because I mean, you've got I will say it's a two-part thing because you know getting people used to driving a rally cross car with a controller is initially a challenge when you get your head around it it's not as difficult as you first thought but it's it's knowing how to drive it and the second thing like I say developing that you know what, what were the challenges there well there are a few different things we had to do one is we had to update quite a lot of the physics engine the physics engine for project cars one or even at the start of our production cycle, was set up for uh, high performance road cars or race cars that don't have much suspension travel and they do not have the same type of drivetrain. So we had to work on engineering the long suspension travel. We had to redo the drivetrain, especially the center differential. In a rallycross car, you pull the handbrake, you can still send drive to the front uh, wheels. So we had to do a lot of engineering around that. And um, so th there was a lot of work to do there. And then the same goes with our approach to the tire model was quite different. Um, and a lot of the engineering we'd work that we did for the cars going sideways in Rallycross fed back into the handling of the cars over the limit. If you want, you can take a, a rear wheel drive road car and drift it. Yeah. yeah. And that's not any special drift mode. It's just a fact that you can do that in real life. Yeah. You've seen many videos on, on um, where people take a supercar and they go sideways with it and they're burning the tires. You can do that in real life. So in a simulation, you must be able to do the same thing. So we had to rework some of um, our knowledge with the, the tire model and update some of the uh, programming of the tires over the limit sideways. And also when the, the tire is spinning and going over the surface and clawing at it, and even if it's uh, smoking or um, burning, uh, there's something happening there on a molecular level that we had to simulate. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's another aspect. And then the environmental thing was quite big. The, all the new surfaces that we had to simulate, gravel, dirt, um, and what happens when it rains there or when it snows, and all these mixed surfaces. So we had to do a fair amount of engineering work just with the, the, um, the surfaces. And then we had to go make all these rally cross tracks, uh, and we made sure to do some from the best tracks from across Europe, yeah. but also some of the tracks that are in use in the uh, American series as well. And then we also had to go and build and license all the cars. So it was quite a big undertaking. Big, big, big job. I mean, the next thing really is, we went to Goodwood Festival of Speed recently, and we had real racing drivers playing 
Project Cars 2 and the real racing drivers were going faster than the sim racers. So we've now reached a point where racing drivers are picking up, going faster than the sim racers. That's quite an important point because I've seen sim racers playing sims for years saying and crashing off and saying it's nothing like real life and in a way games almost got a bad rep in a way for that they would yeah. you'd see curbs in games where a car would spin off and I've had racing drivers say to me I you know I don't touch that curb not because I'll spin out because it hurts my back so I don't want to hit that curb but that's why we avoid it but you can hit it fine um, so I guess uh, it must be great for you guys well exactly you got that's the next bit it's like no we're not going to do that but the next, you know, I guess the point not now yet. is not yet, not yet. That's the next one. Pain Say no more. <laughs> rider, rider physicality. Um, but yeah. uh, but um, no, uh, driver physicality, shall I say? No, but I, I guess uh, it must be great for you guys to know that your physics model has reached a point where real racing drivers are playing the various modes. You know, the rally cross. You yeah. know, the, the the drifting, whatever it is, and saying, I get this. I, I feel this. I, I'm at home. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we brought in some some new drivers um, who were not involved with Project Cars One to boost the uh, the team of drivers. So one of them is Tommy Milner, a team Corvette driver, yep. a class winner at Le Mans twice, mm -hmm. one of the most successful GT drivers right now. But we've known him for quite a long time, and um, it, it, he is an interesting story. He was sim racing back in the uh, SCGT days mm -hmm. um, when he was a teenager and yeah. he was doing that before he started go-karting. So he's very experienced with simulation and he has the ability to dissect, to drive in the simulation yep. and dissect exactly what's happening, draw a slip curve and then uh, feed that back to the programmers. Yeah. So he's had a big effect on the GT tires in particular. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, we brought in two Rallycross uh, champions one of them, Mitchell de Young, is quite well known in the sim racing community. And again, those guys just hammered on the uh, the rally cross, and they also brought a, a different perspective to things um, that we feel very confident now. And yeah, it was a, a marker moment for us when we had uh, Tommy Milner going up against some sim racers, and his lap times were just a bit quicker because he's a professional, right? That's yeah. what he does for a living. Um, and I'm sure if you got the world's top sim racing teams, it would be a real battle. That's great. But That's great. Um, it's, we're, we feel like we've got one-to-one -one parity now between real-life driving techniques and in-game simulation yeah. driving techniques. Well, that's great. And well, I have to say, guys, I mean, not, we're, we're strapped for time today, but it's been great being here at Brands Hatch for the racing. It's great to see how Project Cars 2 has turned out. And I think, you know, whatever anyone says, the fact that racing drivers are beating sim racers on a racing game, I think, says says it all, really. So, uh, well done where that's concerned. And like you say, we'll look at the previews and brilliant. Thanks for your time. I just want to touch on yeah. something very quickly. You actually started asking about it and we left it there, the gamepad control. Yeah. So, with Project Cars 1, we were raked over the coals because it was difficult out of the box. We gave the, the player all the options to go tweak it, but it was tough to get it right. So, we spent a lot of time working on Project Cars 2 to make the out-of-the-box gamepad handling um, really good and I was just like out of the corner of my eye watching this guy sitting behind us he's playing with a game pad I don't know if you guys if you can if you can actually even see it but if you do watch this video watch it back and just pay attention this guy here is sitting here playing on a game pad and it's pretty darn impressive I can see it in a little screen yeah. over there you can see it yeah yeah absolutely. and it's pretty darn impressive so we're certainly far happier with yeah. it out of the box now than what it was in well I, I can tell you right now and I'll have detailed breakdowns on uh, just the changes in handling you know the way the car would pull to one side or the rear end would overtake you and stuff and you've balanced all that now so it's been great steps forward well as i say you know amazing steps forward and uh yeah thanks for your time guys brilliant thank you're you. welcome alan thank you